And in Utah, they really sort of uh, evolved this uh, building technique into these like, uh, like really, really delicate uh, uh, contemporary structures. Even the, the Navajo Indians, their Hogans, uh, use uh, logs uh, to create these like quite organic shapes. Um, and finally, the Pacific uh, Railroad, um, when, they, when they made the railroad, they, they uh, put it on foundations of these giant wood piles that were stuck into the, into the Salt Lake. Uh, and as the, the railroad disappeared, uh, these, uh, these giant uh, piles have been marinating in salt uh, for decades. And now there's an entire company that actually extracts these piles. Uh, and they have this an amazing texture and will last forever because they are so saturated with salt. So we propose to take all of these different fragments of the sort of uh, infrastructure of the past industry of Park City and, and use them to sort of uh, uh, realize this uh, like contemporary building. And essentially, the, the thickness uh, of the logs allows, uh, by turning each log gently from, uh, from one log to the next, we can actually do this like, very contemporary and complex shape in a completely straightforward uh, way. Um, almost like a do-it-yourself that the, the model we built, the architectural model is really built the way we would, uh, we would build the building. Um, uh, and of course, like uh, inside the coalition building, you had uh, like this sort of steel structure sur surrounded by a wood frame. And because the galleries require climate control, we build them as independent structures. And then they're like framed with this like self-carrying uh, wood structure. And because like wood today is almost reduced to being a finish because of like the thermal breaks and the complex sections through the wall, you add like almost like a veneer. And in this case, what you see is really what you get. The, the building is really built out of uh, wood logs. And, um, and all of the sort of circulation uh, cantilevering of the wood sort of follows the, this like rotating structure. So as you enter into the building, you'll follow the light. You have the big gallery at the bottom. You have like the big restaurant uh, uh, opening up to the roof terrace that is on top of the existing building. Uh, and then you've, you continue along the wood uh, up to the upper gallery where you have daylight and, uh, and views. And it really be becomes like this sort of the first thing you see when you arrive to town is actually what's what's on at the upper gallery as, a, as an exhibition. Um, so I really like this idea that the, the new Kimball Arts Center is really, uh, you know, what the coalition building was for the infrastructure of the past is what it is for this, uh, this new and sort of cultural and social activity of, uh, of Park City of, of today. So it's like, it's like really a fact that somehow the infrastructure of the past gets reinvented as, uh, as social programs today. And I think in many ways what, what we're doing at House Street is trying to sort of take that sensibility and, and accelerate it uh, in, uh, in Vancouver. A another example of this, uh, this tendency, uh, we got invited to do a project next to uh, Shakespeare's uh, uh, Hamlet's castle in uh, Copenhagen, uh, the Kronborg Castle. Uh, it, it recently became World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage, uh, and the Maritime Museum is inside the castle. It had to get kicked out because when Hamlet was around, there was no Maritime Museum. Uh, and they proposed that we could put it inside this old dry dock uh, that was like leaking and full of water, uh, where they used to build ships. Maybe we could, it could, could become a museum. Uh, but the museum program was twice the size of the dock itself. So we thought like instead of drowning uh, the museum and program, turning it into this claustrophobic underground museum, uh, if we could keep the dock empty as this like 150 meter long, 25 meter wide, sort of industrial public space sunken be beneath the surface of the water, it could be exciting. The dock was in such a bad state, as you could see it was full of water, that we would have to reinforce the dock from the inside to hold the pressure from the outside, or to hammer new dock walls to take the pressure before it reaches the historical dock. Um, so we thought like, if we're gonna do a new dock wall anyway, why don't we leave space enough so we can actually wedge the museum between the new and the old dock walls essentially turning the museum brief inside out, um, become this sort of void that you descend into. It also became the perfect resolution of this dilemma that uh, uh, the UNESCO said that the museum had to be completely invisible, not to block the, the view of the castle. Uh, of course, the sponsors of the museum and the museum director wanted some kind of architectural masterpiece. <laughs> uh, so by turning it inside out and making it into a void, we could combine the need for invisibility with the desire for exposure. We designed a series of bridges that you can descend into and, and into the museum. 
the bridges have museum programs inside, like for auditoria or, uh, or the restaurant, and it becomes like a public space where you're literally eight meters below the sea, which is just behind this last bridge. Uh, and also, even though the whole thing is underground, uh, the bridges bring daylight because the, the dock becomes a, a giant courtyard, uh, bringing daylight into this uh, completely subterranean uh, uh, maritime museum. When we did the competition, we thought, like, there's no way we're going to win this job because, like, there's one condition in the brief, and that is that we have to build inside the dock, and we put the museum around it. Um, but the jury uh, liked the idea, and we won the, the, the project. Um, and then something strange happened. Uh, the Danish uh, Architects Association, which is my union, uh, they sued the client for having chosen a project that broke the conditions of the brief. Uh, <laughs> which made me seriously reconsider my membership of the, of the Danish Architects Association. Uh, but at this point, the, the clients had gotten so convinced by this was the only approach they wanted to pursue, so they say, okay, we cancel the competition, we hire big uh, uh, as our architects. <laughs> so, so now we're actually in the process of doing what is paradoxically the tallest building we've built in Denmark, uh, but it's from zero and down. Um, so, the, so the last example, like, you know, you, Sometimes you can reinvent infrastructure uh, to have a social program, but in, in one case, uh, for like an art museum uh, in, a, in a sculpture park, we got a, uh, invited to do a, a, a 20,000 square foot art museum uh, in this beautiful park, and like an incredible landscape. There's an existing mill on the water, and you have all these sculptures. Um, and the existing sculpture park uh, is like moving around uh, across the river between the, the, the one side of the river and, and the island. But the client had just planned to purchase a, a giant new uh, uh, area on the other side of the water. Um, and he had sort of proposed to sort of put the new museum next to the existing mill. Um, but his, his sculpture park was going to be like this very broken up experience. And we thought maybe the museum could actually be the solution to turn the entire sculpture park into a single continuous loop, essentially a bridge that, that crosses the, the river. It's a very steep side on one side and flat on the other. So the, sort of, uh, the, the volume of the museum sort of adapts to accommodate the, the level change. Um, you get a gallery with uh, side views, uh, a skylit gallery, uh, a media gallery, and a, a picture gallery. Uh, and then connected by this special space uh, that's sort of contaminated by the, by the form of the building. Um, a single window turns from skylight to, uh, to panoramic window. And as you sort of uh, arrive, you, you're walking in the sculpture park, the path enters into the, the gallery, you enter into this like triple height space, uh, you move up along the, uh, the sloping floor, you reach this moment where the building turns, it becomes this fanning stair that connects all of the different uh, levels of the gallery. Uh, you have this skylight that then sort of kinks and becomes the, uh, the window that gives you a, a beautiful view from a distance of the, uh, of the mill. Uh, and you can continue into the sculpture park and beyond with your, with, with your visit. Um, so in many ways, the museum becomes almost like a hybrid between a building, a bridge, and a sculpture in its own right. You can almost see the museum as one of the biggest sculptures in the sculpture park. Uh, and as you approach it from, uh, from different sides, it really changes character and, uh, uh, and is sort of uh, almost like integrated as one of the, uh, one of the art pieces in the... Uh, in the park. So that's sort of a handful of examples of this sort of very interesting relationship between infrastructure and, uh, uh, and social programs. Uh, another one of the ideas that have sort of been uh, shaping our work uh, uh, over the last, uh, last years uh, is this sort of notion that architecture has to be much more than, you know, an expressive sculpture or uh, a pretty facade. It has to be almost like the design of ecosystems, man-made ecosystems, where we channel not only the flow of, of people, but also the flow of resources through our cities and buildings. Um, and one of the reasons for the significance of this role of the architect and architecture, you can find in the atmosphere of this image, it was taken at the COP15, United Nations Conference on Climate Change in Copenhagen two years ago. And as you can see on the faces of like <laughs> Merkel and Brown, Obama, and I think especially Sarkozy, uh, <laughs> It wasn't exactly a party. Um, <laughs> it was like, it was a complete failure. No goals were, were met that had been established for the summit. 
And the general discussion about sustainability was drowning in this sort of general idea or misconception that sustainability is a question of how much of our current quality of life are we willing to sacrifice in order to afford being sustainable? Uh, essentially, this idea that how, like sort of this sort of Protestant idea that it has to hurt to do good. Um, so when we were, were asked to do the Danish pavilion for the Shanghai World Expo that was dealing about sustainable cities in 2010, we thought, what about a different kind of sustainability? What if uh, sustainable cities and buildings can actually increase our quality of life and our enjoyment? So we decided to sort of consolidate all of the elements of Danish city life that makes the sustainable city nicer to live in. We made the pavilion as a Danish streetscape, uh, complete with the blue bicycle lanes of, uh, of Denmark. And the Copenhagen city bikes, this system of free bicycles we've had the last 20 years that allows you to bike around the city on a borrowed bike. So you could really bike uh, around the pavilion. You could also bike through the exhibition making it the ideal museum for impatient people. Because uh, <laughs> you could actually do the whole thing in two minutes without missing anything. Um, also, our first project in Copenhagen was actually the Copenhagen Harbor Bath, because uh, through some investments in uh, surface uh, uh, sewage and, and water treatment, our industrial harbor has become so clean you can swim in it. So uh, we sort of expanded public life uh, into the water. Um, and essentially, we, uh, we sort of to give the, the Chinese the, the experience of, uh, of how clean, uh, if not how cold, uh, Copenhagen Harbor water is, we made this harbor bath in the middle of the pavilion. Um, and finally, we tried to say, like, how can we attract the Chinese to come and experience the joy of biking through the city instead of being stuck in a traffic jam? Because uh, like, actually, 40% of the Copenhageners commute by bicycle. Um, in 2010, there was an 11-day traffic jam in Shenzhen, making some guy stuck in his car for 11 days. That's like the opposite of, uh, of human enjoyment. It's like human incarceration. Um, but to attract the Chinese to come and experience this, we found uh, a strong common denominator between Denmark and China is that in the Chinese public school curriculum, they have three fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen which means that all of the Chinese actually grew up with the story of the Little Mermaid, uh, the sort of the, the national symbol of Denmark. Um, so we proposed to move the Little Mermaid to China for six months, uh, not a copy, but the actual mermaid. Um, uh, when the Danish Nationalist Party, the sort of the Danish equivalent of the Tea Party, uh, <laughs> when they heard about this, they tried to pass a law specifically against moving the mermaid. So I had to go to Parliament and argue her case personally. Um, and as you can see, we got her. Um, then we had to get her through Chinese customs. <laughs> and, uh, and into the pavilion. Um, in, um, in her absence, we invited the Chinese artist Ai Weiwei to do, uh, <laughs> to do an art installation. And what he did was he installed a security camera in the pavilion, uh, the same sort of surveillance camera that the Chinese state has installed in front of his studio. Um, but this one is part of a, an installation he called the Mermaid Exchange, because it transmits a live image to where she would normally sit in, uh, in Copenhagen. So the tourists who went in vain would see that she was OK. Um, but more importantly, it became like a, a loophole in the Great Firewall of China becoming the only uncensored TV feed uh, from, the, from China to the rest of the world. Um, so that was sort of the first time we coined the idea of hedonistic sustainability, how sustainable cities can actually increase life quality. Uh, at the same time, we got invited to do a competition for the headquarters for the Shenzhen uh, Energy Company, the energy company of the most industrial region in the world. Um, and it's essentially a, it's a million square foot office building in a humid subtropical climate. And the basic idea of the building is that, you know, you have the dilemma that you really want to have views and daylight, but you don't want thermal exposure and glare and air conditioning. So basically, the, the facade is made like a pleated dress, uh, blocking the, the, view, the, the sun from the south and opening to the view and the daylight from the north. So when you look north, it's an all glass facade. When you look south, you see these bamboo veneer panels washed in daylight. Uh, within that logic, we can expand openings, the sky lobby for the executive wing, the main entrance at the bottom. Um, so it almost becomes this sort of Isi Miyaki fabric. Uh, and this very simple idea with no technology whatsoever, no moving parts, 
reduces the, uh, the air conditioning with 30%. Uh, just because the way it uh, responds to, uh, uh, to light. So essentially, what ma makes the building look different is also what makes it uh, perform different. Another idea that we've been pursuing, trying to sort of find uh, synergies within the city, is, is this sort of notion of, of architectural alchemy, that by mixing different ingredients in untraditional mixtures, you can create added value. Uh, we did a, a project in Copenhagen called The Mountain, uh, that actually um, mixes an apartment building and a parking building uh, to create a man-made mountain in a completely flat landscape of Copenhagen uh, that actually combines the penthouse view of an urban location with a, you know, a suburban home with a house with a garden where the, your kids can run out and play and uh, enjoy the weather outside. This is made possible by putting all of the apartments on top of a big parking structure. Um, you have a single funicular elevator that gives access to all the apartments. It's wrapped, the parking is naturally ventilated and naturally illuminated by wrapping it in a perforated aluminum plate. Uh, we control the hole sizes, there's six different sizes, and because the holes look dark on the bright aluminum, from a distance it turns into a gigantic urban artwork for free. Um, so since this like, image of Mount Everest is actually the holes that also makes the building breathe. Um, so this idea of architectural alchemy that you can actually create added value or extra quality of life by mixing programs, we took uh, to another level with uh, the same client, uh, Pierre Höfner in, in Copenhagen. Uh, it's in this new development area uh, on the outskirts of Copenhagen. The, the lake is really the city limits. The rest is going to be landscape. And they imagine this dense uh, urban development uh, popping up. Uh, and the big question is like, when you make an entire new neighborhood from scratch, how do you impregnate it with diversity and the liveliness of a historical city? Um, what you typically do is that you put on some different facades on top of a lot of identical apartments to make, create this sort of cosmetic illusion of diversity. We thought, what about real diversity? Shops and offices that like to be close to the customers uh, on the street. Apartments go on top. But because residential space is less deep than commercial space, we get space for little gardens and maybe a small path in front of the townhouses. Then we add a layer of more classic apartments and then finally penthouse townhouses with roof gardens and front lawns. Then the, the master plan dictates a shortcut through the building, so we turn it into a figure eight that sort of connects these two new urban spaces on either side of the building. And finally, as in Shenzhen, commercial spaces, they like daylight, but they hate sunshine. They spend energy on cooling. So to the south, we push the offices to the bottom, to the ground. And to the north, we create a four-story office building that also lifts up the apartments into the view and, uh, and the sun. Um, and then finally, in the southwest corner, we push the corner down to open up the entire courtyard uh, for, for views and, uh, and daylight. And this sort of optimization, first like the layer cake where we stack the programs where they want to be, and then we optimize it to sort of respond to the to the concerns for daylight view and, and cooling uh, and sunshine. Uh, and that sort of distorts the building into this sort of twisted figure eight that also sort of expands the, the public realm to actually sort of invade the, uh, the, the building. It's really sort of, as you can see, like we started building right before the global uh, financial crisis and the collapse of the Copenhagen real estate market. So uh, uh, the neighbors haven't really arrived yet. Uh, <laughs> Uh, except in the form of, uh, of cattle. <laughs> but uh, so in that sense, we were also kind of excited that by doing what we did, we also maximized the sort of, in a way, the urban intensity within the block. Because this idea of architectural alchemy doesn't only allow us to optimize the conditions for the individual programs. You know, you can see how the townhouses are lifted up in the sunshine, sitting on a base of offices that have uh, shade and but daylight. Uh, but it also expands the public realm, the possibility for spontaneous social encounters that are so crucial for creating a, a community or a neighborhood when you're starting from scratch. Uh, and in this case, it's traditionally, you know, normally it's traditionally restricted to occurring on the street level. In this case, it's really invited to invade the three-dimensional space of the urban block. So the eight house is not just like a pretty facade or an expressive sculpture, it's really a three-dimensional urban condition that carves out niches for public life throughout the three-dimensional space 